The person steering Chernobyl Unit 4 to its scheduled shutdown on the night of April 26th, 1986, was not Anatoly Dyatlov, as considered by many, but the shift supervisor Alexander Akimov. It was he who made many of the difficult decisions that night, all of which culminated in the explosion and the race to prevent a worse accident from occurring, ultimately costing his own life. But who was Akimov really? Was he the easily swayed man depicted in the HBO TV miniseries? The complete opposite? Or somewhere in between? I'll let you be the judge of this. Alexander Akimov was born May 6th, 1953, in Novosibirsk, a city on the banks of the Ob River, the first of three sons in a highly regarded family. Fedor Akimov, his father, was a well-respected officer in the Marine Coast Guard that Alexander looked up to. He wasn't the only one that respected the senior Akimov. All of the adults saw Fedor as an important comrade to aspire to be, and as a result the children were considered untouchable by their peers. While others may have exercised this for their own gain, Alexander did not. He would protect others, including older children, such as his close childhood friend, Alexander Nebikov. Alexander was not like other children his age. While they would be far more interested in fishing or picking berries, the young Akimov would have his head buried in literature and share his passion through his strength in retelling such stories, one of his favourites being Jack London's Martin Eden. He also had a passion for engineering, and after graduation he successfully enrolled at the Moscow Power Engineering Institute where he would meet Razim Davletbaev, another person who would work at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. He would also meet Nebikov again, studying law at the Moscow State University. Despite the occasional meetups and Nebikov offering free tickets to numerous popular bands that visited the Moscow State University student cafe, normally extremely expensive, their friendship never fully rekindled, as Akimov was far too focused on achieving the highest grades possible. After finishing his studies, he earned a place at Zook Hydro Project, a prestigious hydraulics engineering school, where he would meet his wife, Luba, a student in the same department. They married before graduation. Once they had, with both graduating with top honours, they were sent to Chernobyl to work for Zook Hydro Project with Akimov proving himself through his work, transferring to the staff of the nuclear power plant and earning the role of senior turbine control engineer. Here, he worked under none other than the now famous Nikolai Steinberg, who at this point in time was the chief of the turbine hall, and it was around this time that Steinberg decided to hire Katya Litovsky as part of Akimov's shift, the only woman surrounded by 22 men. The productivity of the turbine hall went up. Litovsky divorced from her husband. Akimov was fast to settle into the role and establish a reputation, joining the Communist Party and becoming party secretary for Unit 1. As his wife gave birth to their first child, he invested himself in historical biographies in the military, following in the footsteps of his wife, the daughter of a military officer herself. He also took the opportunity to hunt in the Pripyat marshes, targeting ducks and hares with a Winchester rifle. Their second child, however, was born with a twisted hip, and Luba had to take the trip every two weeks down to Kyiv to treat him, using the Pripyat hydrofoil. His work in the Communist Party and at the nuclear power plant paid off and, on the 10th of July 1984, Akimov was promoted from working as the shift supervisor of the turbine hall to the shift supervisor of Unit 4. He would oversee the actions of the operators at the control room, assisting when necessary and assuring that all the work was completed. It was also here that Akimov would go on to meet Leonid Toptonov, and the two of them quickly became friends and then akin to brothers. The two shared an inseparable bond through shared interests and Toptonov's desire for an older brother. Akimov had complete faith in the nuclear power plant that he worked for. When asked to produce a program that would cover the step-by-step -step procedures following a nuclear accident that released radiation outside the building, Akimov stated 
that the odds of such an event occurring, based on his knowledge, were 1 in 10 million per year. Of course, this had already happened in 1982. On midnight of April 25th, 1986, Akimov was in command of Unit 4, acting as the shift supervisor, and was given the order to begin to lower power. And so, reactor power began to drop, from 3100 megawatts down to 1500. Done in small drops, with periods of stabilisation between, this was true control of the reactor, but then they reached a hitch. When the Scala computer gave its printout of reactor parameters that morning, and gave a reading of 13.2, below the minimum permissible operating reactivity margin of 15. In reality, the Scala computer had made an error, not counting the 12 automatic control rods, meaning the true operating reactivity margin was 18. Akimov passed this information on to Rogozhkin, his superior on shift at the time. According to regulations, if Scala showed that the operating reactivity margin went below 15 rods, even if this was just a computational error, the reactor should have been shut down. But this rule was dismissed by the senior workers. With the reactor scheduled to be shut down later that day, this regulation was considered a mere formality, and Akimov received no punishment for the event. He and the rest of the shift simply went home after they handed it over to Kazachkov and his crew. On the way back to his apartment to get some well-earned rest, he bumped into Victor Smagin, who was set to work the day shift of April 26th. Akimov filled him in. The turbine experiment was to be completed, and when the reactor was shut down they had to do the air cooling experiment. When he woke up and called the nuclear power plant that evening, to his surprise he found the reactor was still running, and the rundown was yet to be carried out. So, naturally, Akimov made his way to Unit 4 a bit earlier to be filled in on what happened. Ten minutes later, the shift change occurred, and now Akimov was once again at the helm of Chernobyl Unit 4. For the next few minutes, Akimov went from desk to desk, getting information on the status and work to be carried out on each desk, while Dyatlov ordered that they hurry up. Eventually, he left, and took the pressure off of his back. While Akimov was paying attention to juggling various phone calls and preparing the turbine for the future rundown, and the measurements requested by the Kharkiv turbine plant, he was snapped back to reality by alarms at Tobtonov's desk. At 28 minutes past midnight on April 26th, a series of computer errors caused Tobtonov to lose control of Reactor 4, and the power plunged to as low as 30 megawatts of thermal output. While you may think that this is a severe problem, almost shutting down the reactor, to the operators it was not. The situation could be remedied. Yuri Tregub was the first to start raising control rods, then Akimov, and finally Toptonov, the least experienced of the three. At one point, Tregub noticed Toptonov was pulling the control rods unevenly, mostly from one half of the reactor. Seeing it as a teaching opportunity, Tregub guided Toptonov and one control rods to withdraw from the reactor. When Dyatlov returned to the control room, he saw the group withdrawing all the control rods and authorised them to continue, not concerned by the power drop either. Akimov then requested permission to raise the power to only 200 megawatts, which Dyatlov approved. And so, Akimov continued to monitor the situation at each desk, making final preparations and going from person to person, making sure they knew what to do. Then he gave the order to Gennady Metlenko to start the rundown, and the last 40 seconds of Chernobyl Unit 4 commenced. Officially, Toptonov was supposed to shut down the reactor the moment that the test began. However, he did not do this. In fact, he was waiting for a signal from Akimov. Seconds passed. The water flow to the reactor decreased, and power began to rise slowly. Automatic control rods descended, stopping the increase. At this point, Toptonov turned to Akimov, asking what he should do. Akimov, on the other side of the control room, motioned to the AZ-5 button, and then turned back to watching the program. Everything was calm, there were no signs of what was going to unfold seconds later. And then, warning lights flashed, an alarm sounded, 
Akimov ran to the desk as Toptonov yelled out that there was a power surge. He ordered him to press the AZ-5 button, and in a final act of desperation, flipped the con switch, which released all control rods from their electromagnetic clutches, allowing them to fall into the reactor under their own gravity. But it was already too late. At 1.2348, Chernobyl Unit 4 exploded. Immediately following the accident, many of the official duties lay with both Akimov and Dyatlov, and Akimov was the one insistent on trying to restart the flow of water to the reactor, going against Dyatlov's judgement that the core had exploded. It was a logical assumption that still supplying water would benefit, and thus he attempted to do so. It also fell on him to cut the electrical supply to most of Unit 4 to preserve their batteries, plunging most of the building into darkness. But Akimov's most critical job fell in the morning. Alongside Akimov, Nekayev, Uskov and Orlov, he ascended to room 714 stroke 2, a narrow passageway with a series of valves that, when opened, would allow water to flow from the steam separators down into the reactor. The room was flooded with radioactive water, and the further into the room they traversed, the higher the radioactivity. Toptonov, Nekayev and Akimov were allocated to the far end and they stood in the ankle-deep water as more showered over them, using a miner's lamp for light, trying to open the valves. By the time they left, Toptonov was vomiting, and both he and Akimov had contracted lethal doses of radiation. When they returned to the control room, it was obvious that they weren't going to be able to work much longer, so they tried to explain their work to the day shift that had arrived in the control room while they were opening the valves. But this was impossible. Between the sentences, they had to run to the bin to throw up, and there was nothing left to throw up at some point. And then, Akimov and Toptonov departed from the infirmary. When Akimov arrived, he could barely get into the chair before collapsing into a vomiting fit. While his wife was initially turned away from Pripyat Hospital No. 126, they managed to communicate while Akimov underwent an intravenous transfusion from a window, with many of the other families who gathered at the back of the building. Akimov merely asked a simple question. How was she? How were his two sons? Above all else, he seemed very proud of both, Lubov thought. As the day drew to a close, the workers, still conscious from the night of the explosion, gathered together on their ward. Akimov's entire face had settled into a deep tan, and together with the likes of Viktor Smagin and Anatoly Dyatlov, they debated the causes of the accident. That evening, Akimov joined the first of the extraordinary convoy, transporting all the most severely affected patients from hospital number 126 to Kiev, and then a chartered flight to Moscow, where they would undergo treatment at Moscow hospital number 6. In there, it became apparent that Akimov would be one of the first to die, his time in room 714 stroke 2 proving most significant as not only did he stand under the pouring water streaming out of the remains of the steam separators, but he swallowed some of it. His lungs and gastrointestinal tract were gutted, pneumonia and intestinal hemorrhaging quick to manifest. Even with the leukocyte cells, stem cells found in bone marrow, transplanted from his twin brother, he was ravaged. His moustache fell out with ease, disturbing his wife. Some optimism remained and Akimov promised he would never return to the nuclear field. He would much rather be a hunter out in the wild, at peace with nature. Interrogation of Akimov proved difficult, as his swollen body made it virtually impossible to communicate by speaking or writing. But still, the investigators persisted, and Akimov struggled through in hospital. May 6th, Akimov turned 33, but his body had little strength, and he fell into a coma. Four days later, on May 10th, Alexander Akimov passed away, skinned blackened by radiation, eyes wide open. His cause of death was listed as skin and intestinal injuries. The leukocyte cell transplant had no chance to work. He was buried in the Matinsko Cemetery in Moscow, the original plot cleared and itself buried under concrete to make way for the modern memorial plaque. Akimov was dead but his legacy, how people would remember him, 
was now a tool to be weaponized in the face of those who loved him and those who battled the accident alongside him. No official acknowledgement of his role in suppressing the accident was ever publicized, and instead letters were sent to his family, explaining the only reason he would not be charged for the crime of causing the disaster was the fact that he was dead. Dyatlov was quick to send his own letter, praising Akimov as a hero. This letter was sent based upon the cover-up version of events as proposed by the Government Commission on May 5, 1986. Headed by the likes of Alexander Meshkov and supported by Shubina and Legasov, they laid the blame at the operators for disabling safety systems and letting the reactor reach a state of unstoppable runaway. The AZ-5 button became preventative of, rather than the cause of, the disaster. Akimov never had the chance to defend this. It will fall on his former boss, Nikolai Steinberg, to lead INSAG-7, which would redirect blame towards the design of the reactor instead. The degree of cover-up continued into the trial. When witnesses acted in defense of Akimov and his actions, they were simply dismissed from the stand. Even in a show trial, the evidence had to fit. The final court ruling decreed that Akimov was soft and indecisive, and acted out of fear from Dyatlov's reprisal. But the final nail in the coffin came not with the trial, nor any Soviet government piece, but a book. The Truth About Chernobyl by Grigory Medvedev formed the basis of pop culture understanding of the accident, laying the groundwork for series like the HBO miniseries. It is here that Akimov's supposed softness and indecisiveness is put on full display, and for a reason nobody has ever ascertained, it is he who now presses AZ-5. Even with the publication of Intag 7, this crippled version of Akimov and his understanding of the accident remains perpetually entwined with the media, simply because the story has been projected the loudest. In September of 2008, Akimov was recognised by the Ukrainian government for his heroism and bravery in facing the Chernobyl disaster. He was awarded the Ukrainian Order for Courage, third class. With the exception of small interviews in Grigory Medvedev's book, his family have largely disappeared into the world, seeking privacy from the trauma of one night in April. Akimov is only immortalised at his grave with the very tombstone depicting a carved face of him, and on the website of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, where he appears in the Book of Memory of Liquidators. <laughs>